What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? So I want to cover a little bit of uh, the pre-draft visits that have been going on so for us. So I guess for starters, just kind of breaking down what the pre-draft visit is, right? So we have 30 invitations we can essentially extend out. Um, I think the common misperception is that they have to be for round one targets or, you know, at least that's what they should be used for, essentially. Um, and that that's actually not the case. In fact, I would probably argue maybe half of those uh, 30 visits are for 15 prospects they ideally really like at the top of the round. Um, and then the other 15 is a combination of other things we'll get into. So uh, medical evaluations, uh, smoke screens, um, you can even say maybe targets in later rounds or even undrafted free agents potentially uh, that they really kind of want to hone in on and narrow a couple things down uh, so that they can kind of prioritize them because the round one uh, prospects are who are going to get all the excitement. But as everybody knows, you really build the team from rounds two to seven. And then there's even teams uh, that have consistently been able to churn out uh, talent from the undrafted free agent pool. So it doesn't really matter how you get into the league. It's just about what you do once you get into there, which is a great thing. So as far as the New York Jets are considered, uh, we've extended, I want to say about eight invitations that I can think of. Uh, so we have defensive in uh, Aiden Hutchinson. We have Ika McWanu that we brought in the tackle. Uh, both of the wide receivers from Ohio State and Chris Olav and Garrett Wilson we have defensive end Trayvon Walker uh, from Georgia, who's been skyrocketing up every board imaginable. Um, we also have wide receiver Jamison Williams, uh, defensive end Jermaine Johnson. Um, and then we recently heard about uh, cornerback Ahmad Sauce Gardner and then defensive end Kayvon Thibodeau. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a slow process. We still got, you know, just over under-ish three weeks. Uh, until the draft officially starts. So, you know, the team will be cranking away at their boards and these visits and everything up until the very last moment. So don't, you know, reflect too much on uh, not even having, you know, 10 draft visits or so. But I think the list of names is interesting. So when we take a look at it, the defensive ends by themselves aren't necessarily – Anything crazy, uh, we have Aiden Hutchinson, who's long been considered a top five pick. Uh, same thing with Kayvon Thibodeau prior to, you know, talks about them sliding. Uh, but then you have Jermaine Johnson and then you have Trayvon Walker. And I think these two are very, uh, it's a very interesting situation for both of them. While Jermaine Johnson has a little bit more of uh, the gaudy pass rushing statistics you like to see. I think he had 12 and a half sacks. Uh, this year or last year, however you want to look at it. Um, that hasn't been the case for Trayvon Walker. All Trayvon Walker did was go into the combine and, you know, detonate some C4 there, which had him flying up every board possible. Um, and we see that, you know, the workout warriors that go to the combine, people that just, you know, have ridiculous displays of athleticism, strength, speed, etc. Uh, he fits that mold. Um, the two names for them are interesting because I think those will be potential selections if it works out that way at number 10, not necessarily at number four, but it also depends on what we do at number four. I've been seeing mock drafts where suddenly we're picking Garrett Wilson at number four, even though um, almost every analyst that you can speak to, even almost currently, will tell you uh, there's no wide receiver worth a top 10 pick necessarily. It's just more kind of like a forced issue. Um, so it, it's interesting from that perspective to me personally, Jermaine Johnson and Trayvon Walker, I would say at, you know, best case scenario should be middle tier round one prospects. Um, and that's literally off the strength of kind of combine work. Everything else is more. So if you look at the game tape, I, I don't think they match up with the Kayvon Thibodeau's, the Aiden Hutchinson's, uh, even George Karloftis. Um, and that's oddly enough, a name that we don't have yet. So, uh, taking a look at some of the other prospects, we only have one of the tackles so far in Ika Mekwanu, uh, but he's a player until recently uh, with Evan Neal speaking out saying you can slot him anywhere but center. Um, Ika Mekwanu is kind of the same thing. He's going to give you a lot of that versatility. So 
we could feasibly still pick up a tackle as the best player available on the board at four and then see who slides to 10 or maybe we try to pack up, package up and move up. Um, I don't think that would behoove us to do so, but it can be an option. Uh, and then, of course, the wide receivers is what I was more so expecting. I think uh, we're definitely going to do our due diligence here. If it's going to happen, I'm almost positive it's going to happen at 10 or in a trade down scenario. I really don't see us reaching at four just to say we secured a, a number one wide receiver we believe in when even with the Tyree kill trades um, and, and the, the compensation that we put out there, we didn't offer up any first round picks. So, um, but yeah, taking a look at the wide receiver pool that we had there, Chris Olav, Garrett Wilson. Uh, I've been saying I've been a much bigger fan of Chris Olav uh, since maybe a little bit before or after the combine. Um, Garrett Wilson, I like. It's just when I was seeing some of his highlights even and then more so some of the game breakdown, uh, game film breakdown from like Jets X Factor uh, or X Factor, uh, play like a Jet and a couple others. I could pick up on it without being the deepest film study. His route running is there, but it's a little bit clunky to me. You see him take some really weird steps, and then it puts him in a position where he has the body control, but he's really contorting his body in like weird motions um, that takes away from some of the yards after catch opportunities and things like that that he would have had. But this isn't a prospect breakdown, just kind of some thoughts on the players there. Um, jumping back into some of the pre-draft visit uh info though i wanted to cover so it, it's a little bit weird i haven't seen anything necessarily um detailing how long we have with the prospects anymore i know when COVID was going crazy and everybody went to the virtual format uh they lay out an hour per prospect um i don't know if that's really the same thing but it's been pretty cool because uh now that people can come back into the facility uh i'm assuming it's a little bit more of a throwback feel uh for the gms However, uh, the great news, I would say, is that we can essentially do everything with the prospect other than, you know, on field work. We can break down film study. This is just be a Q&A session, uh, extended meet and greet. Um, we can do medical evaluations. We can do pretty much the whole gambit, uh, which is really good. So when it comes to the pre-draft visits, um, I would say one of the bigger uses for it is going to be refining the process moving forward. It's kind of a, an unhidden benefit, right? Let's say you do use your 30 visits on all round 130 prospects, at least for what's projected uh, or what's your uh, you know best player available chart is going to look like. You're not going to be able to pick all 30 players, right? Even in the best case scenario, maybe you get two of those if you have you know a high round selection. So it gives our coaching staff and the scouting team and ability to kind of refine the process. Once the players actually get drafted, once we take a look at the situations they went to, who was around them, you know, a couple years into the league, what have they done? You can kind of get a better idea of what your evaluation process looks like, how far you were um, from, you know, hitting on certain prospects, or, you know, was there a player you thought was going to be excellent? That was a complete bust and kind of the reasons behind those. So, uh, I love that hidden benefit of this, you know, pre-draft visit process. Uh, I already talked about us not strictly having to stay with round one prospects. Um, I'm interested to see what this full list ends up looking like by the time the draft rolls around, because I think ideally, even when GMs are kind of trying to hide who they might be interested in, you're going to pick up on something, right? So I would imagine that we're probably going to see a few more wide receivers on here, uh, more so in that second, third round range. Um, and then I also think we start seeing some linebackers uh, and then potentially some of the safety candidates for sure. And I think that's from like a third and fourth round perspective. I don't think, honestly, we see like a Kyle Hamilton on here, for example, uh, which I'm perfectly fine with. Um then, of course, there's the smoke screen. So, I mean, it all kind of, you know, it, it's what I've already been mentioning. You know, if you see a team like, let's say, Jacksonville, for instance, they went out and they spent a ridiculous amount of money and brought in all these players uh, to surround uh, Trevor Lawrence. They don't necessarily have the same needs that they did before. So whereas normally we would have pinpointed like a tackle like we've been seeing uh, throughout most of the, the mock draft period, um, 
that might not be the case anymore. But it's essentially either been like an Evan Neal or it's been uh, an Aiden Hutchinson or whoever the top uh, you know defensive end projected is going to be at the time for the Jaguars. If you take a look at their pre-draft 30 visits and there's no Aiden Hutchinson, no Kayvon Thibodeau, uh, you know, not even a Trevant, uh, Tra uh, Trayvon Walker uh, or any of the tackle prospects, you can pretty much hedge your bet uh, that they're trying to hide who specifically may be in those ranks they're interested in. Um, so I like the chess game that comes along with the pre-draft visits too. Um, and then, as I mentioned, one of the main, main things that I love, and I, I didn't realize this until I was researching, is we can the coaching staffs and the, the teams that are bringing these players in can do their own personal medical evaluations with their own training uh, and health staffs with these prospects. So if you take a look from the Jets' perspective, uh, uh, Derek Stingley's list Frank injury for his foot, for example, we know that he got cleared. He just had the pro day. He ran like, a, I think it was a 4-3-7 last updates I've seen. Um Maybe we want to get in there and take a look at that Liz Frank injury ourselves. What does it show? The x-rays that we get, talking it through, etc. You would have to imagine it is squared away with how quick he was able to run today. And, you know, I, I got to see how the rest of the drills went. But that's pretty much an example, right? You get to rely on your own staff and the own evaluations that you're used to. Um, and for the Jets, I would say that's a huge plus, especially with them revamping that uh, Jets Atlantic Health um, uh performance department that they just initiated you know i think it was a year or two ago now um so that's going to help refine that process and what that department looks like as well but let me know what your guys' thoughts are are there any particular prospects that you would prefer to see the jets uh get a pre-draft visit with i haven't heard any interesting information come out of any of these visits um in terms of anything going extremely well you know ahmad sauce gardner is getting a lot more of the uh uh, the, you know, the quotable headlines in terms of being a candidate for us at four. Um, but there's been nothing specific in terms of like an absolute negative or anything of the sort there. Uh, but again, let me know who you guys would uh, love to see come in on a visit. I'll catch up with you again. Peace.